sorry. <laughs> Did you let me continue? Um, the acts of teaching, performance, craft, digital experience are all interactions which involve a transfer and creation of knowledge between different groups of people. This panel brings together people from different specialisms to discuss how this transfer of knowledge occurs and what it means for our designed world. Our panelists are Tony, Thomas, and Fleur. Tony's work studies armature casting and sculpture practitioners and how different types of knowledge exchange travel across Europe in the 19th century. She looks at verbal exchange of design knowledge, how to track it, and also how practical versus academic knowledge exchange can be examined. Thomas's work focuses on mending as a design process and the long lives of repairs. His dissertation focuses on two case studies, semi-professional mending practice and um, at the turn of the 19th century on, and conservation training at the VNA between 1987 and 2009. He asks how we can understand repair as a democratized design process, pulling together, together a plethora of temporally distant agents in its processes. Fleur's postgraduate research broadly focuses on replication, reproduction, and knowledge exchange of medieval design in both modern and medieval contexts. Her dissertation examines medieval automata as a high technical object uh, while exploring collaborative design practice in a world where the concept of design didn't yet exist. Uh, so thank you for all of our panelists to come here tonight to speak about the research and about knowledge, knowledge exchange. Uh, so I'm going to kick off with the first question. Um, why are you interested in knowledge, knowledge exchange and how it uh, relates, relates to your research? So Fleur, do you want to start? Sure. So I think as a design historian trying to understand and trace how knowledge has been exchanged, disseminated or transmitted is really fascinating, especially when it relates to complex knowledge about making or creating objects, architectures or other design technologies. And in my research, I examine different scales and levels of knowledge exchange about medieval automata and technology. So from the sort of large scale transfer of knowledge of these sort of forms of complex mechanical design which kind of are transmitted from the Islamicate world into medieval Europe to the scale of kind of between individuals such as artisans and scholars in medieval European university cities and also on the kind of public scale through performances and processions where these kind of mechanized devices were used and how they were viewed by the public and how that knowledge of technology was therefore sort of transmitted to the public um, just because they were in the audience. Amazing and an interesting way to look at knowledge exchange. Um, Tony, do you want to continue? Yeah, um, it's a similar kind of process is about, um, for me, it's about learning about different processes and um, how can we see those different processes in the objects um, around us, the objects that are displayed, um, but how how different um, processes have been taught as well. And like um, my research is very focusing on um, the kind of the, the relationship between the master and the student in how that goes. And it's not just um, teacher and student, but also like, um, uh, so, different people coming in and being trained up in specific processes as well, um, especially with the armature construction. Um, so yeah, I found it really interesting and strange to research. <laughs> Are we all? <laughs> um, Tom, do you want to answer? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so like Tony, my research comes to it from a comes at knowledge exchange from a pedagogical angle um, and looking at teaching environments. Um, and so my kind of broad question, I should say that my dissertation is still in progress, so a lot of this is going to be present tense rather than past tense. Um, 
looks at understanding repair and lending as design process. And that's through two pedagogical case studies, because I think it's uh, teaching and sites where knowledge exchange is openly carried out are really useful ways of uncovering principles or attitudes that were that can quite easily be obfuscate, you know, hidden usually. Um, yeah, so my first case is looking at the RCA VNA um, Conservation MA program which operated between 2008, uh, 2008 and 1987. And that's quite a professionalized studio-based practice course and site, site of knowledge transferal. Um, and then I'm comparing that uh, to the book, Mending and Repairing, oops, which my background is fading out. Um, <laughs> by a chap called Charles Leyland that was published in 1896, uh, which is this less formalized, people you know, buy this and try and apply the techniques and such in their homes. So I've got those kind of two quite radically different sites of, of knowledge exchange in my research. One thing I would say is that I conceive of knowledge exchange in quite a broad way. So not just incorporating like you were saying the the, the master the, the, you know here's the master here's the students i think it can incorporate materials and institutions you know the weather in the studio on a certain day um yes i'm i'm interested in quite a broad could broadly construed construed um attitude to the to the question great <laughs> um so you all have you all are working on different periods and different specialisms, different realms. Um, so I'm curious to know how, how do you trace knowledge exchange in every one of these fields? Uh, because it's something that sometimes can be untraceable. <laughs> and how did you go about researching it? Um, Tony, do you want to start? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, it's something that, um, I've gone about three kind of different ways and um, with this particular project anyway, um, because of COVID, unfortunately, the object uh, route wasn't necessarily um, the easiest one to try and go down. Um, but what I did find was, you know, there's snippets of conversation that are recorded down in parliament um, that have a very scathing um, reviews on specific teachers' attitudes towards uh, modeling classes or, um, you know, the, um, the books that were printed as well or demonstrations that had then been written up in, into newspaper articles um, with uh, images would have been really kind of useful to kind of break down and really go into the details of it. Um, and then, you know, finding objects as well that um, were made by not just one firm or one person, but made by somebody under the supervision of somebody else um, can really tell you a lot about uh, the networks involved in the knowledge exchanges. Um, and it's just trying to find those tiny nuggets of detail um, which is the really difficult thing of like, okay, you know, you say fibrous plaster, what does that mean? <laughs> what is fibrous plaster? Um, you know, so like trying to figure out actually what the details are that are involved in that um, and how that evolved over years, you know, from the time it was painted to, to um, you know, 50 years later when it's still being used, but has evolved in the process. Um, so I think it's just like digging for gold, really. Um, um, and it sounds like you do find some treasures. <laughs> uh, Tom, do you want to continue? Yeah, of course. Um, so I think tracing knowledge exchange, particularly in, as you were saying, Tony, the context of the pandemic when we are divorced from the material and those outputs that kind of connect makers that you know we'd love to center our work on aren't um 
aren't accessible I, okay, is, is interesting and something I've certainly adapted to. Um, I think I was relatively lucky in as much as in the context of the VNA RCA course, it's a very reflexive archive where a bunch of students are basically saying, okay, here's the work I've done over the course. Here's me kind of writing about who I am as a practitioner. Kind of, this is you know, my, my identity as a student. Um, and so you've got, you, that, that's quite good. And of course, as well, the, um, when, when working with a manual, it's a piece of work that is created for the express purpose of transferring transferring knowledge um, but one one thing that I think I, I think you can be optimistic about that but there's also more of a problem when it comes to Fleur and I went to uh, were, went on exchange earlier this year to the Bard Graduate Centre in New York um, and part of the work I did there was working with conservators um, they had in their research team and I, I remember one notable conversation where they said, look, if you're reading a conservation report, you're not going to understand half of what's in it unless you were trained in a very specific time in this studio, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all, there's even that, that, uh, that kind of coded in there. And I think in normal times, I'd be jumping at the, the written archive and going, oh yeah, come on, this is brilliant and the material. But the pandemic um, has forced me to experiment with research uh, research methods like interviews that capture those more um, uh, those more kind of cultural parts of of the exchange um, and I think yeah I, th I think that's been a really productive part, part of my research. Cool. <laughs> uh, so you were talking about um, not understanding things that were written at a particular time and I'm sure Flora has something to say <laughs> about that as well. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think tracing medieval knowledge exchange is always going to be very difficult. And strangely, um, I think the pandemic context, I think being somebody who works with medieval kind of material culture and design and making, I'm incredibly used to having to deal with like no source survival or <laughs> just the lack of, um, you know, uh, particular mentions of, of, of people or makers or conversations um, just because of the nature of, of how far back I'm, I'm working. So weirdly because of, it's frustrating because I can't guess the kind of the material artifacts if they have survived or the tools that, if they have survived but apart from that I'm kind of <laughs> I'm used to having this very fragmentary source base anyway and having to really um kind of be very uh creative and experimental in how I work with it to try and um illuminate and highlight certain stories and exchanges um so I particularly um just so <laughs> everyone's sort of on the same page in my kind of time frame when I say medieval I specifically work on the late middle ages which is roughly about 1100 to 1450 so like even from that kind of time frame probably compared to either Tom or Suetoni I'm, I'm navigating kind of centuries rather than decades or even years um, so in some ways I can kind of be more flexible when it comes to trying to trace things through sources because I can really trace that sort of longer term exchange through the centuries but for example to kind of give about give some examples of how I went about researching um, this kind of knowledge transmission um, kind of the exchange of knowledge from the Islamic world into medieval Europe for example from about the 12th century onwards um, I'm looking at sources that specifically mention individuals and um, translating texts relating to um, mechanics for example or kind of creating self-moving humans or statues or heads um, and that frequently happened in Spain, in southern Spain, which kind of, you know, had a lot of um, uh, Islamic presence in it. And quite often a good tip that I found is trying to look for mentions of, of magic <laughs> or sort of foreign knowledge, non-Christian knowledge, because that tends to lead you to sort of where maybe Islamic knowledge was starting to kind of interact and be transmitted and translated into Europe, literally through the language, because it was seen as sort of foreign and magical because it didn't fit the, the Christian ideology. 
at the time. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a sort of example into where I'm kind of trying to find mentions of this knowledge kind of starting to seep into Europe at the beginning of the late Middle Ages. Um, I think when I'm dealing slightly more with maybe the sort of the craft and the maker knowledge that again is really difficult because um, it was never really necessarily written down. <laughs> um, and so I'm trying to weirdly I kind of have to rely on tracing the knowledge exchange between scholars and intellectuals and craft kind of um, practitioners and makers because through those sources from scholars and intellectuals they're the ones who wrote it down and they're the ones whose sources have been preserved so that's where we can trace that form of craft knowledge because you know the actual practitioners weren't necessarily writing it down and even if they did it probably wouldn't have survived because it was probably a working text um so in that way i quite often as well we will look to um, kind of maybe cultural history as well um, quite often so kind of looking at uh, you know uh, frames of reference or language around metal working and construction that was used in universities um, in the middle ages so quite often uh, language around sort of uh, blacksmithing and, and forges was used as a kind of referenced ways about learning about the world or maintaining knowledge in your mind or even in reference to like nature creating human bodies is quite often seen as like metal working and kind of constructing and so I suppose I'm trying to sort of build this idea that there's a sort of shared cultural language between um, intellectuals in the middle ages and the craftspeople and kind of trying to show that sort of exchange and collaboration through the culture and cultural iterations of it and I mean, that's just an example of one of the ways I'm trying to sort of highlight this <laughs> exchange. But as you can see, it's very complicated. And I think, um, but I think, yeah, in some ways, being a medievalist and pandemic, you're kind of trained to be dealing with <laughs> no sources or no access to sources. So in a weird way, it's been an advantage. Yeah. Well, they knew their pandemics well, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The original plague. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're all kind of talking about some sort of like a, scavenger hunt <laughs> that you had to to get your evidence and your research kind of like puzzled through um, and you were talking a lot about your challenges in that um, and I also want to ask uh, what are the type of networks that you have found that are engaged in this kind of exchanges um, who or what groups uh, do they operate between uh, Tom do you want to start yeah, sure. So, like I said earlier, I'm very conscious of wanting to conceive of this quite widely. Um, and uh, that's partially inspired by new materialist perspectives. Um, but I, I also think that if we think of our own teaching experiences, they always take this multipolar view rather than just being between uh, his teacher, his student. Um, yeah, you know, so you've got, say, your, not just the textbook you're working from, the, the paper you produce and the person teaching, you've got, you know, the highlighter you use the evening before to scratch up your notes, you've got the friend who you phone up and say, oh yes, come on, I'm, uh, I'm in a tough spot. <laughs> um, yeah, so I and I think that in my own research, um, I'm very interested in what the in in how that multipolarity um, come, comes into working with objects and pre being presented with, say, a cracked bowl or here's a piece of textile of, of textile that needs rebacking or um, operations like that um, and how working with the material in those cases can often represent it can often broaden that network out you know when someone is working with a um, uh, there's there's one one thing that Charles Leyland says he loves to do is go around Italy and pick up old you know shards of pot um, and glue them back together and, and kind of winkly says, oh yeah, you can sell these for you know, a lot of money. People think they, knew, they were new. 
Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm interested in how that connects the makers of the original object, the person kind of learning to, to mend the, the um, you know, the materials, uh, the, the material bounds of, um, and things they're learning to work with. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's kind of my take. I'm, I'm big on, on broadness. <laughs> <laughs> Again, aren't we all? <laughs> um, Tony, do you want to continue? Yeah, I mean, like um, Tom's just said, it's it's a quite a broad thing, and there's so many networks involved. Um, you know, for me, it's the um, directors and the committees who are deciding, you know, what knowledge to teach and where are they getting that knowledge from. They're actually getting that knowledge from you know, the universities that have been set up in Europe and bringing it over. And then, you know, that curriculum is then fed to the students and taught to the students. But within the student body, you've got practitioners from and apprentices from so many different backgrounds um, that that's its own network of, you know, those people are also speaking to each other. And that's another set of knowledges that, you know, will then be fed back to um, the masters of those particular workshops. And it's like, um, but then even outside of that, you've got the societal societies that would put on lectures or, um, you know, exchanges between um, the carpenter who would provide the frames um, for the large plaster casts or, you know, um, to, the plaster makers in the casters. So there's so many different networks involved that it's kind of really difficult. And I think it's difficult to, um, to try not to put um, suppositions of what those conversations would be like uh, to have, um, you know, instead having actual evidence that this is, this is an exchange that's taken place. Um, but yeah, there's, um, there's so many different levels of networks as well. And there's, they feed into each other and around each other and um, just kind of keep going in this endless cycle of you know, people who know people and materials that work with different materials and processes. So it's, you know, definitely needs, you know, the network of the material itself um, is something to, consider I think as well um, yeah so you kind of have like networks over networks over networks <laughs> influencing each other um, Fleur I think you would also have something similar yeah <laughs> no I definitely <laughs> empathize with the kind of you know yeah broad scale of you know interacting huge networks um, over time and geographies I mean the uh, kind of similarly to Tony, actually, um, a lot of the types of network that I'm looking at centered around universities. But you know, I'm talking about the European universities when they started, you know, <laughs> literally in like the you know 11th, 12th centuries, um, and when they sort of first started forming and 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 the cities sort of started sort of really working around those at their centre um, in Europe. So I mean, I'm I'm dealing with this kind of transmission of design knowledge and engineering knowledge coming in from the Islamic world and that was normally um you know passed into Europe through sort of traveling scholars that were sort of interacting in Spain as I mentioned um but it, it's very much still in those sort of scholarly intellectual circles and they were sort of scholars quite often from you know modern day Baghdad or Iran um that were working in their languages and they maybe visited southern Spain um, you know, spoke about these texts, these texts are translated into Latin or vice versa, scholars from Europe would visit and bring them back this knowledge. And if it was translated into Latin, that was the universal language in Europe at the time, because it was a language of Christianity. And so it was able to spread across Europe and across and be used in, in these universities. Um, and I think one thing that's quite interesting to know <laughs> that probably makes mine even huge and broader is that this knowledge isn't it didn't necessarily always you know fully originate in um, the Islamicate world it came originally from ancient Greece 
So I'm just really honing in on this one form of uh, technological knowledge about automata, which are kind of um, mechanical devices that mimic um, living things. So, you know, mimic humans or animals or, or plants. And that's kind of my um, focus so that my research doesn't get completely <laughs> crazy and off the scale. Um, but pretty much all of the knowledge that, that forms what we think of as kind of, you know, European scholastic knowledge um, and philosophy came from ancient Greece, was actually translated into Islamic world and then came through this translation movement, this huge translation movement, which lasted about a century into Europe. And I just find that incredibly fascinating how just a simple act of, you know, translating into the Islamic eight languages and then translating from that into Latin kind of created this huge, um, a lot of historians call it a renaissance, which is quite debated, um, but this kind of explosion of, um, of thought and creativity that really transformed Europe and, and my sort of story and my focus around automata and mechanical knowledge and design um, is just trying to tell us more part of that. Um, yeah, so those are the kind of networks I'm really focusing on and, and especially then how they, those university networks interacted with craftspeople and artisans. And interestingly, by the end of the late Middle Ages, um, the artisans in cities had you know, formed their own kind of organizations and institutions called guilds which kind of mirrored the university formats, you know, in terms of sort of hierarchy and, and power almost. And I find that really interesting that they're kind of not only, you know, interacting with the scholars, but they're kind of elevated more to the middle class um, <laughs> level in cities, um, sort of working and functioning in groups. Um, these makers have kind of created institutions that mirror the scholarly ones. And that's a lot of what my work is about, is that kind of collaboration or interaction and knowledge exchange between the scholars and the makers. Um, and, and those guilds were also the ones who quite often would um, pay for and create the plays and processions and performances that I mentioned, where um, these mechanical devices would be on show and therefore would sort of transmit this knowledge to the more general sort of public in the Middle Ages who weren't necessarily part of the university or the guilds. And I find that really interesting that nonverbal sort of knowledge exchange that didn't necessarily need um, the written word or even, you know, words themselves, maybe through observation. So one fantastic example is um, Richard II actually got crowned um, in London uh, in his coronation procession. He got crowned by a mechanical angel. And that was in 1377. And I just can't get my head around how incredible a sight that must have been. And this is in a world where people very much believed in, in angels and demons and magic. And it must have, that sort of transfer of knowledge of, you know, a mechanical device must have created such, you know, wonder and fear and amazement in, in the audience. And so, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm rambling a little bit, but this kind of huge interaction of networks um, from this sort of, you know, scale from, from ancient Greece to, you know, somebody watching a coronation procession in, in London in the 14th century is really fascinating, but it does rest on those engagement and interactions and networks. And that's very complex to unpick, but um, I think it's worth doing. Nothing is more complex than a medieval mechanical angel. That sounds <laughs> amazing. I wish I was there. <laughs> um, so I'm going to the last question before we start to answer the audience questions. Um, so. Tony kind of touched on it, uh, but I want to ask you how how does how how do you how do you make sure or don't make sure <laughs> that how does your position fit into the this exchanges? How do you how do you know where to where to position yourself in this whole big network? Um, Tony, do you want to start? Um, I can do. Um... <laughs> for me it's it's really difficult one of the reasons that I wanted to do um this particular project was because um I'd come from a practitioner background of having to teach students um about plaster casting and modeling and molding um so I was very aware that there are armatures in plaster casts um and so that's why my fo my focus was you know on this hidden thing that is a design element of the making is often really not talked about as you know a skill um, or a level and I think that 
you know, with all of the information that I've read about all the um, the demonstrations that I've read through and the, the books that were then published throughout um, towards the latter end of the 19th century, there's a really real difficulty of practitioners that when they wrote these or they did the demonstrations that there's a level of assumed knowledge from their audience as well. Um, and as a practitioner who knows plaster, that has actually really helped with my knowledge um, and um, being able to you know, decipher what it is they're discussing and um, it what point you know certain things would have had to be inserted in um, into plaster cast at a certain time or you know um, what level or consistency the plaster would have had to be at to be able to hold up an armature inside a mold um, which was has kind of been briefly mentioned in like one or two words and then rushed over um, because it wasn't as important to the demonstration as the other information that they were discussing um, about the surface um, finishing and um, kind of that that kind of thing. So for me, it's the, it's the haptic skills and like the knowing and the you know. I think my position is definitely from the maker point of view and how to translate those. Um, almost unconscious knowledges that the masters of these processes have um, that don't always get written down. Um, they just get assumed or passed over because they've been doing it for so long and they're so, so good at what they do that it's a second nature. It's that um, muscle memory kind of knowledge, you know, of being able to look at a bolt and know what size it is for the spanner um kind of knowledge um so for me it's like being very aware of those tiny little details um which has really helped my position i think because i've as i've been researching this and trying to e eke out those details and wanting to know more about that that little detail there um so it's been, yeah, it's been really interesting in that way. And, and knowing as well that the practitioners, some, you know, some of the, the master practitioners of the 19th century actually opened up their workshop to the public. So it was, there was another type of knowledge exchange there of observation from the public of just being able to watch and um, observe a master at work of those being able to see the process instead of just being described it as well. So. Oh, you you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> uh, it's, <laughs> it's fascinated how you're, um, you can position yourself as the maker, even though you're talking about a completely different time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, Tom, do you wanna continue? Yeah, sure. This, um, yeah, that, that uh, I think, I'm not sure if it's a tension or if it's, or what it is, but uh, writing essentially work that outputs as a text and as this, I'm going to produce a paper that is knowledge that. Um, after studying um, knowledge transfer processes that are all about knowledge how is, a dynamic, <laughs> um, you know how I how one um, you know it, it, it happens again and again in uh, mending and repairing that he says, well, this kind of propositional recipe of how we go through this isn't enough to know about. You know, don't expect it to work if if it, if you do it first time. You've got to do it again and again and build up this. Um, embodied knowledge uh, of uh, and kind of tactile understanding of the materials that you're working with. Um, so yeah, I think I think that that's a that's an interesting dynamic. Um, as a researcher, it's kind of my long 
ambition to, to play with that and do some reconstruction and just to slip in some rep. I'm, I'm writing a workshop in inverted commas for um, the website that will focus on ceramic, uh, on binding together ceramic with brass and then doing a kind of plaster and egg cement with it, which is from mending and repairing. Um, and I think that uh, while I haven't fully worked out how that incorporates me into this network of people who are practicing as a result of Charles Leyland's work, um, it's really interesting to think about. <laughs> and there's some, there's some kind of innate pull towards, towards practice and doing it and seeing what productive understanding results in my work. Um, yeah, the, the other half of this question is that uh, until I undertook my dissertation project, I, was, I worked on quite you know, relatively temporally distant um, stuff. I, I did some work on a game, a, a bone games box that was produced by Napoleonic prisoners of war and then on ceramic mending in the long 18th century. Um, and that's all quite temporally distant. And then when I when I started working with the VNA RCA course, suddenly the people I was reading about, oh wait, they're kind of walking around and <laughs> doing stuff, and they're researchers um, who very kindly have you know provided me with a lot of resources over over the course of lockdown. And I became aware that you know be, being a researcher, partic particularly of a uh, bit of contemporary history, was about negotiating that relationship with this still very alive and changing community. Um, yeah, that's still, it, it still has, has its own influence, it's aging and changing. Um, yeah, so I think that essentially uh, knowledge exchange, it, while it seems that we're studying the exchange between parties in the past, it's what I'd call a call a symmetric relationship, where we it, it that knowledge comes to us as well, and then you know we're we're incorporated in the in the network very much so, and shouldn't take that for granted. Um, yeah, all right. <laughs> That's me. Great. Uh, so, Fleur, how do you uh, position yourself? Well, sadly, I don't have any uh, <laughs> living sources. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so i think I, I go about kind of my positionality by i kind of try to think of it as sort of submerging myself in the middle ages and and i think it's helped <laughs> I, I did um i did uh, my undergraduate degree i did history and i kind of did three sort of years of medieval history which has really helped and i think um you really have to have an appreciation that it's a it was a one way I think of it is a bit like it's just a different culture or a different country. And it, you have to have a different way of thinking. They had a different way of thinking about things. They had different ways of believing about things. And um, a good example is maybe an attitude to a headache. So, um, and again, this is very difficult to measure, but it's just a kind of, um, a good kind of, uh, you know, analogy. But um, say if you were somebody in the middle ages, maybe and you got a headache, you quite often think that you had to sort of, it was a good thing to suffer through the pain because maybe, you know, God had given you that headache for a reason, you'd sin, you'd whatever. Um, whereas obviously now we see pain as something bad and we just want to get rid of it and we take a painkiller. So that's a sort of simple example um, that one of my tutors told me at undergrad where you kind of really have to get into this um, idea that it was just a completely different worldview um, that you're dealing with. So you have to deal with it with caution and try to not be judgmental or belittling you know in a, in a period pre you know what we think of sort of the renaissance and science and technology um and to try and not sort of retrospectively judge or, or label which is very difficult when <laughs> when i'm dealing with something called design history and everything hinges around this this word design and that will that word or this kind of modern our modern idea or what we think of as design practice um, really came about probably in the European relations, if not a lot later, and I'm dealing with what happened before that. So I'm kind of trying to think of ways or, or words or definitions or, or ways of thinking that 
could be seen as in line with our contemporary idea of what design and design practice is. I'm having to try and do that very tentatively as to not retrospectively label or to be judgmental. So it's a very difficult um, tension and position <laughs> to be in. And I think I'm always learning. I, I don't think it's an easy, an easy place to be. And um, there's certainly been times where I think, is this actually possible? But I really think there is. And I think what drives me is, um, you know, kind of, you read a lot. <laughs> a lot in, in, in historiography and even in design history kind of writing itself where it quite often a lot of books on design history will sort of, in my view, relatively arbitrarily start in the European Renaissance. And I think there's these huge, incredible designs and um, skills in engineering and architecture. And in my case, what I'm looking at kind of these complex mechanistic devices. Is that not what we see as design? You know, isn't it that kind of collaborative interaction of of makers with sort of technical and intellectual knowledge coming together. I, I feel like that's the same conversation. It's just happening in a different way and in a society that we see as so kind of alien to now, we don't feel like we can work with it. So as you can see, I'm quite passionate about it. So um, yeah, that's what, what really trying to drives me to really try and dig deep and, and bring these um, conversations to the surface and bring it into the chronology of design history. Um, and yeah, a lot of historians, a lot of historical people talk about, you know, the dark ages and how in the middle ages, nobody really knew anything and they were all kind of dying of the plague and <laughs> scared of, you know, the devil and all this stuff. And, and it's, in my opinion, is very untrue. So it, yeah, kind of this kind of passion <laughs> for illuminating these people's incredible kind of work and outputs and knowledge really, really does drive me. Um, but I think, yeah, in terms of having a position as a sort of very much a 20th century woman or 21st century sort of thinker um, and trying to go back into the 11th century it's very difficult but I think you've just got to think of it yeah as in kind of I suppose, uh, there's that very kind of famous phrase to that the past is a foreign country but I think that's quite a good <laughs> good way of thinking about it to try and not be judgmental and to just really understand that it was a completely different um, way of experiencing the world um, and that doesn't mean that it's better or worse, but you have to tread carefully um, when you're researching it. Yeah. I'm sure the pandemic helped understanding yes. uh, how it felt <laughs> like. Yeah. It's been really interesting. Medievalists are suddenly in demand. Everyone's like, oh, tell us about the plague. <laughs> you know, people are reading all these sources of what people wrote during uh, the 14th century. They're like, oh, yeah, see, we're relevant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We need to summon them. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's start with the um, questions from our beautiful audience. Um, starting from Thomas with H to Thomas with no H. Um, how the two different case studies interact, complement, or work against one another? Yeah, this is um, so proviso. I am. Um, I recently restructured my project, so uh, I, this is something I'm still working out myself. Um, I'm very aware that uh, I am not going to get, uh, you know, the case of something that was mended using techniques in mending and repairing, and then, oh look, there's this item in the v &A collections that, you know, was treated with by a student. There's not that kind of direct historical timeline going through. But I think that one thing I noticed in the literature surrounding um, repair as a design process was that it concentrated on the instance of repair. Like, okay, here's the, th the new thing that has broken. Um, we are presented with this challenge, kind of let's, let's look, at, look at that. Um, and the two case studies were ways of looking at the long life of repairs um, and in these and, and how object the fixing of objects that sometimes have come kind of straight off the production line, but also objects that have been in collections quite quite a long time. Um, and I think there's lots of interesting comparisons between, Charles Leyland was beginning, it, a lot of the techniques are pitched as being, uh, oh, there are things you can find in the, in the museum and you, know, you become a professional restorer. But on the other hand, he says, uh, 
oh yeah, this this gift would make a great uh, this this book would make a great gift for newlyweds um, who could use it to fix things around the home. Or I have travelled. Uh, there's a really bizarre paragraph where he talks about oh yeah, I've travelled in you know the Wild West and uh, all these techniques have come in great use here. And there's lots of interactions not just between the way it was becoming a restoration at the time was becoming professionalized but um the way in, in which it was becoming it, it was not coming out of it was still very much ingratiated in kind of the economies of the home in female labor particularly in um yeah there's there's a whole bunch and i think that there's something very interesting about comparing that kind of embryonic professional network of, of knowledge exchange with the quite in some ways more formalized uh, network that conservation uh, that kind of more contemporary conservation practice represents um yeah i mean that's that's my current thoughts no doubt it will change but uh, I would love a book on mending things around the house. I will let you know when I'm getting married. Um, we have a question from Lizzie. Uh, she, it's a question for all three speakers. Uh, you spoke very engagedly about different types of knowledge exchange. I would also be interested in hearing about any obstacles, resistance to knowledge ex slash resistance to knowledge exchange that you came across during your research. Um, anyone want to start with that? Uh, I can if you want. Um, so I think maybe one sort of obstacle or, or challenge um, was kind of the getting into an understanding of the oral culture of the Middle Ages. So quite often, and initially myself at the beginning was thinking, you know, lack of written down forms of knowledge sort of maybe beyond surviving examples or the fact that craftsmen or artisans wouldn't necessarily write down their knowledge or evidence their knowledge exchanges is going to be really difficult and that's definitely true but I think I really started to research and absorb myself in um, finding out how kind of oral knowledge exchanges are very present in the medieval city and that's really wonderful to find out about on one hand because it means that you know, craftspeople or non-literate people or people who had literacy, but sort of for a specific job, not necessarily sort of reading high literature, um, were able to interact with and enjoy and um, have knowledge of uh, kind of popular works of fiction, for example. So um, these tales, these sort of nightly tales were quite often sort of sung or told on the streets and other people would recite them and sing them and it meant that people were able to enjoy this kind of form of popular culture without needing access to a book or, or literature. Um, and that's great to, to, <laughs> to find out about because it means I don't have to rely on, oh, you know, my blacksmith in Florence having access to a book in the university or whatever, because, you know, he might have found out about kind of automata through these, you know, incredible tales of magic and fantasy that were being sung on the street corner every day. Um, however, it's a bit of a challenge and obstacle because it's very difficult therefore to sort of estimate how these ideas or these stories especially were sort of disseminated. You can't really estimate the empirical reach of sort of oral culture really. And I mean, I think one way around it is to kind of figure out how many actual physical books of some of these stories and these tales have survived in manuscript form. And therefore we can suggest it's like popularity from that. You know, if we've got hundreds, it probably means that there were probably a lot more and therefore they were being sort of chanted and sung quite frequently because people really loved them. Um, and also I think I've tried to prove through maybe certain cultural tropes, I suppose like the angel, for example, that were popping up quite often <laughs> to give that example again in, in pageants or performances. Uh, you know, if people, if they were sort of frequently happening, it meant that people had a sort of familiarity or relationship to them probably present in other forms of kind of culture that they were getting. Um, but yeah, that was probably a bit of a <laughs> roundabout answer, but it's a bit of a challenge. Um, it's good to find that, you know, knowledge can be exchanged beyond the written word and the written page in the physical book. But then you're also met with another challenge of how do you measure that or, you know, understand that as a historian and when this was happening, you know, <laughs> like 800 years ago plus. 
So um, yeah, it, it's been an obstacle, but hopefully one that I'm grappling with. Okay. Um, Tony, you were talking about um, the obstacles in your research with, with not handling objects. Do you have any other thoughts about this? Um, yeah, so even even beside just not handling the objects, one of the things that I have found was that there was a massive um, disconnect almost between when, when the government schools of design were first set up, the modeling masters um, were not modelers. Um, they were draw they were artists and they were drawers, but they were not specialist modelers. And um, one Sheffield, um, I believe, is you know quite blatantly said, you know, oh, if you can draw, you can model. It's not that hard. I never modeled before teaching this class. Um, you know, there was a big resistance to actually in employing somebody who knew the process um, and it wasn't until um, about 1852 that actually specialists were brought in specialist practitioners not just specialist um, teachers but specialist practitioners were brought in to teach that knowledge um, and I found that really interesting um, in that kind of sense but like that the yeah the big obstacle um, that I've, I have found is that there's just very little um, recorded, you know, much like Fleur and, you know, the first project that I did on the course was um, actually about molded leather cases from the um, 1500s, 1400s, 1500s. Um, and I never touched leather before. I don't you know, I purposely did something that I didn't know how to make myself. Um, and that was a really good way of pushing beyond my own maker's knowledge and actually observing the object itself um, and observing images and like really um, depictions of workshops and photographs of workshops. And it's really lent itself really well to this project, especially, you know, with that separation from the objects is that I'm having to go into that um, pictorial research a lot more and like really eke out the details of like how workshops are set up, um, you know, or like depictions of like who else was involved in these workshops and, and things like that. So that's that's been um, challenging, but it's, I'm glad that I've managed to do that in my first project because it's lent itself really <laughs> helpfully for this one um, with having that. So yeah, there's there's lots of kind of separations and obstacles and resistance I've I've found to specific knowledge exchange, especially the between practitioners and academics. Great. Um, Tom, do you have any obstacles or resistances? It sounds like the v and curators don't resist, but maybe there's other resistance that you want to talk about. No, no, I'll, I'll keep it brief because I had my own question before. Um, mm -hmm. The, uh, no, no, no resistance from the, from the v &A. They've been really great for, um, the ex-students and staff have been very generous with me. I do have the um, slight problem um, to, to keep it light that people keep on sending me their best work. <laughs> they, they, you can imagine if someone asks you about your time at school and you want to send them, you know, your the, the essay that did well or the prize applica application that succeeded or um, and and things like that. And that's also not something I've I've found in the uh in, in with the online material is the stuff that gets noticed in the news is oh yeah it's so and so wins this prize which is great but i think that there's something to you know that i really want to know about the the stuff that goes wrong as well <laughs> i want to know about notes that you almost threw away or the 
the, the, the essay that didn't do so well, why didn't it do so well, that, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so that's, that's one um, obstacle I've been working with around knowledge exchange from the archive to myself, um, albeit, <laughs> albeit a nice one to have. Um, yeah, I'm sure as design historians, we all wish no one ever threw any piece of paper they wrote <laughs> in their lifetime. Uh, I'm gonna wrap up with the last with a last question from Freya. Uh, Freya asks, uh, I was just wondering if you have ever found knowledge used in ways it wasn't intended. <laughs> um, all of you have discussed how knowledge has been uh, imparted. I was I I was wondering if you have if you have found ways that the knowledge has been adapted or subverted in ways that was not intended by the original teacher or writer. Um, yeah, who wanna kick off? <laughs> I've got a fun example. Um, <laughs> think about subversion quite often um, medieval scholars who were seen to maybe be experimenting with creating automata or sort of self-moving statues or talking heads and things were seen as sort of necromanticists and uh, sort of working with the devil and this was done through powers, sort of demonic powers. And that's another reason maybe why we don't have that many records of how people created, physically created these objects and put them together and these mechanical objects in universities because they were seen to be doing these kind of foreign <laughs> demonic experiments. So I think that's quite an interesting way of thinking about how the knowledge is being subverted to kind of the dark side <laughs> and, and working with sort of, yeah, these sort of work of the devil really in essence. And, and therefore they probably wouldn't have written down about it because they could have, you know, got burned at the stake for that. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else want to pick up on that? Sure, I've got I've got some interesting stuff on on the work of the devil. Um, <laughs> yeah. Aren't yeah. we all? <laughs> yeah, there, there's some uh, because uh, in a lot of early res restoration tradition, there's such a focus on um, putting stuff back to. Or, or blending things in. He, he, Leyland gets really obsessed with thumb blending um, ceramic mends into pots and things like that. It naturally seems to sit by uh, faking and counterfeiting, um, which is a very interesting interaction. And it's a bit of a, it's a hard line to tread because on one, on one side, um, I feel like it's a, things being left unsaid. He, he, he does stuff like says, like says, oh yeah, if you get a certain type of wood and then rub, kind of, if thumb rub a yellow ochre into it, it will look exactly like um, ivory and it will fetch a really great price, you know. Uh, and he doesn't say whether this is on the expectation that, oh, this is just a technique for making something that looks old, everyone knows, or the more uncharitable interpretation that it's meant to deceive. Um, so I, I, that's something that I haven't looked into loads so far, but it's, uh, and there's, it's, it's a bit of a mind filled with, like I said, intents and, you know, that kind of thing. But it's one aspect of early practice I'm very interested in, in exploring. Tony, <laughs> do you want to wrap up? <laughs> Yeah, I think for me, it's not so much um, subverted, but definitely adapted. Like there's a lot of adaptation within making communities of, oh, I'll just use this. You know, it's like um, there's a specific varnish um, that was meant to coat um, stoves, iron stoves, and or re-blacken iron stoves is how it was originally like uh, designed to be used. And it it was um, it was a cheap version of a Japan uh, kind of varnish, um, and so plaster casters from 
slightly later on had kind of started using it as the only varnish to coat the iron rods that you would insert as an armature um, because it would prevent the rust um, it worked really well. Um, so it's that adaptation and that there's a great x-ray of Degas um, wax ballerina model um, and you can um, somebody's analyze like the x-ray and there's cork and sponge and clay and rope and wire and there's everything in there and it's it definitely talks about this great um adaptation of like there's something on my desk that will work um for for this let's use it um but again it's it's talking about those those kind of exchanges between you know different different makers of or you know being aware of what materials are around and what's affordable as well. Um, because obviously if you're doing this as mass production or you know you have this commission, you don't want to be using necessarily the best varnish in the world on the inside of you know the structure. You want all your money to go onto the surface which people see. Because nobody's going to see um, what varnish you use on or even care what varnish you used on the iron structure that goes inside this plaster cast. Um, so there's there's a lot of interesting adaptations um, that have come about, I think, as opposed to subversions. So honestly, that sounds like how I cook. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this was really, really interesting and enjoyable. We exchanged a lot of knowledge. Um, I just want to say many thanks to anyone who joined us today and to all other panels of this week. And a big thank you to our panelists, Tony, Thomas, and Flor, for speaking so beautifully on Knowledge Exchange. Don't forget to visit our website where you can find recordings of all of our panels and much more. You can find, find the link to the website, probably in the chat box. Uh, thank you so much for coming and have a great weekend, everyone. Thank, thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.